Hi, Mark. How are you doing? Roberto, I'm fine. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm really happy that we are together talking this marvelous thing about law and technologies. It's, it's a rich topic. It is. It is. See, you are a CEO of uh, an important uh, blog and media that is Legal Mosaic. And also, <clears throat> you are very known, and that's the way I got into your work. You work and you write for Forbes. Tell us a little bit your experience about law and technology. Well, um, I had, uh, before I uh, started getting into uh, studying the industry of law, uh, I was involved as a practitioner of law. I was a so-called bet the company trial lawyer, um, first as an assistant United States attorney, then later as a the youngest partner in the nation's second largest law firm, uh, and then as a, a little bit of a legal entrepreneur um, by creating my own national legal uh, boutique litigation firm. Um, and I think uh, my first brush with technology was um, while I was practicing, a federal judge appointed me the receiver of a large international aviation parts business that had operations on four continents. Uh, and so not only was I m managing the business, um, but I was also um, overseeing legal operations on these four continents. And I was very frustrated um, by my inability um, to contact lawyers and to get them to be responsive, much less for them to act in a collaborative fashion because I was interested in advancing a uniform company position. So long story short, uh, I, uh, in my practice, uh, represented many large companies, one of which was AT&T. And I went to AT&T because I had read about these fiber optic lines they were laying, uh, a so-called T1 line, which probably doesn't mean much to this generation, but at the time, it was very, very cutting edge. And I said, here are my objectives. I've got three offices here in the States, and I've got large corporate clients all over. How will I be able to use technology to um, basically integrate the offices so that uh, I could have, this is 1991, a centralized digital law library uh, where um, I could have um, video conferencing uh, between and among my offices and with certain key clients, um, where you dial one number and you get the same chirpy voice no matter where you are. Uh, and so they said, well, we can do it for you. And I wrote a check for a million dollars. It was the firm's money, but at that time it was my money. And it was probably the best investment I ever made. And it demonstrated to me way back in 1991 how technology could be applied to the delivery of legal services in a way that was not only internally efficient for my law firm and its various offices, but more importantly, drove great value and efficiency to our clients. So it's really back to that 1991 experience, Roberto, that I can trace uh, my interest in the uh, interplay between technology and, and law. Well, let me tell you one thing. I, I knew your job and your thinking because I was doing some research about you know, general knowledge and how different uh, businesses are connected to technology and the law and the lawyers were kind of very structured and very, very, very hard to convince about technology. And that's one of the, your works and your, your, your writings in Forbes. Why lawyers and why law in general are so tough to accept changes and to adopt technology? Well, I'm going to give you probably the one time that I can answer with one word, economics. Um, the, traditional legal model, as you well know, 
uh, has always been um, very labor intensive, um, very input driven, where, you know, and we're taught at law schools, and I know this not just in the States, but around the world. Law students are taught, number one, the person who gets the highest grade on the exam is the person who creates the most thoughtful, exhaustive list of hypotheticals. What if this happens? What if that happens? Um, you know, it's, it's all about issue identification from the perspective of the lawyer. But as you and I both know, it's not necessarily the lawyer perspective that is paramount. It's the client perspective of what is their risk tolerance? Um, how important is it that they, you know, demonstrate that they are quote unquote right with respect to a particular topic? Um, and so I think that the entire law firm model is built on um, let's, you know, put massive input into it, regardless of the value to clients. And we will be rewarded by our input as opposed to the output or result. And I think that it is for those reasons that um, there is this innate um, uh, pushback that the legal profession has had with technology. And I find it somewhat uh, ironic, Roberto, because lawyers for years um, have uh, used technology in their private lives um, they all have uh, computers. Um, many of them shop on Amazon. Um, many of them use Airbnb. Many of them hail Uber on their smartphones. Um, so question, why would they embrace technology in their personal lives, but be so generally resistant to it in their professional lives? Economics. Well, let me tell you one thing. I had this list of ideas to talk with you, but then you mentioned some things and another thing comes into my mind. I'm really comfortable talking to you because you are a litigator. So you know one important part of legal practice, the real part. I mean, you have uh, damage, you have torts, you have responsibility. And I think that when we talk about law and when we talk about technology, litigation it's a must i mean litigation is really important part that you can rely on evidence and data and stuff do you have any thoughts about that i mean the the legal culture of litigation towards this universal thing that is technology because the technology is universal i always found it ironic to use the term again ironic but there is a lot of irony in law. As someone who is a trial lawyer uh, I, and who lived in a world of evidence, where, as you know, not all evidence is of equal value. Some potential evidence isn't even admissible. It's the same thing with data. Some data is highly relevant, um, maybe even outcome determinative. Other data, less so. Uh, it's all a matter of, you know, sort of what the data is capturing and the relevance of what it is capturing to the matter at hand that, that is important. Now, from a lawyer's perspective, a trial lawyer's perspective, I think that it is crucial that you have more, not less, material data. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little war story from back in the late 90s on how I first, you know, used data back when data was, you know, really not terribly used in, in, in the legal profession. So I used to represent mostly very, very large companies in matters of first impression or matters that involved large amounts of money. I also represented a number of foreign sovereign nations uh, during my practice. And um, uh, by the way, one of which was um, uh, uh, the Republic of Panama. Porque cuando yo vive en Miami, 
uh, yo fui el abogado, el abogado de la República de Panamá y pues es necesario para mí estudiar español porque en Miami todo el mundo habla español. But let me get back to English for a minute because so your English... And then we'll continue in Spanish because... It well, Spanish. I don't know. Um, there, there was a time when I actually gave a talk to the president and the cabinet of Panama, uh, but that was uh, uh, about uh, 30 años pasado. Um, um, now my Spanish gets mixed up with my French and other languages, um, but... Um, no, no. Hello. Mais nous pourrons parler aussi en français. Oh, oui. Quand j'étais à l'école, j'ai douté français. Mais maintenant, espagnol et tout, français. Tout mélange, tout mélange. Oui. Let's continue in English. Let's continue in English. I have, to, I have to keep both in English my mind in English, too. Well, your English, as I say, is much better. I, my Spanish, I understand perfectly, but um, anyway. Um, so, so, getting back to the use of data. Uh, so I had this uh, class action case, and um, the, I recognized that the, the, the key to this was through data. I had to demonstrate through data um, how it was, uh, it, it was data applied to a building uh, uh, defect case. In Hurricane Andrew, uh, which struck Miami in the early 90s, um, there were a whole um, development of houses that um, were devastated. Um, the houses around it, um, built by other developers, were not devastated. And so the key to proving my case as a class action was through data. Um, and how was it that, you know, this particular finite group was, had wildly different results than all these other. It was through data. And uh, I was able to get this data, you know, through various um, computer-driven programs that at that time we created. Um, and the judge was so overwhelmingly convinced by the data. This wasn't just, you know, a, a, a couple of photographs or things. It was data that proved the case. And I realized in an instant, isn't it ironic that lawyers are so loath to, you know, resort to data um, for predictive purposes, for risk mitigation purposes. You know, there, there are any number, particularly from a trial lawyer's perspective. I was a general counsel of an insurance company. The first thing I did I was an outside general counsel, was to, you know, start developing databases on cases because I realized, you know, if you want to properly evaluate a case that goes on, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times a month, um, you know, uh, a, a hip injury or a, 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 you name it, you'd want to have the data to be able to properly um, reserve a case. So from a trial lawyer's perspective, there is absolutely no excuse for not wanting to marshal as much data as you can. I don't know if it happens to you, then when you talk, it happens to me. With traditional lawyers, they think that you're talking about, you know, magic or stuff. I mean, something out of your, the real life. But right now that you're saying this, and I'm, I'm you know, I had in my mind uh, this construction that nothing happens, and the other one, yes, it did. The importance of evidence and data. Well, and you having, know, yeah. Yes, now I've been doing some reading and research about philosophy of evidence. And we have, I don't know if the legal and judicial culture in the United States happens like this, that we have this idea that what doesn't exist in the docket, in the file, it doesn't exist for the purpose of the decision. And I think it has to be all the way around. If it exists in real life, it has to be in the docket. It has to be in the file in order to, to, to take the decision. And the best decision you take is the one that you have more information. And every day we have some information that deals directly with 
even, even if it's a contract or a tort or whatever responsibility it is, and you can't close the door to receive more information that enriches the decisions. And, and by the way, that is the key point that you added at the end, that enriches the decision. It has to be material. So I often you know, smile when I think to myself, how many times have you been in a courtroom where you, or, or in a negotiation, and a lawyer will say, my gut tells me this, or my nose tells me that. Um, and even if that lawyer has a fine reputation, that becomes very subjective. Um, and I'm now the person, because law is nothing more than the persuasion business, right? So which is going to be more persuasive to you? If I say my gut tells me this, or if I say my gut tells me this and here is the data upon which that decision, that assessment is derived. Um, it is a way to buttress and make more informed uh, a, a, a opinion um, than anything else. So, you know, data, data should be used. It could be used, you know, to make a point or refute a point. But the point is that data, you know, is much more relevant than human opinion, in my opinion. It is, it is. Uh, and, 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 and so, and, 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 you know, people think, well, data, maybe it applies to business, but not so much to law. Law is all about, you know, subjectivity and interpretation. That's nonsense. Well, I want to open another part of the discussion. We have some, in, in general, the differences of age. And depending of where you study and where you study or the age you are, you have some, some, uh, thinking thoughts about the technology. What about the judges, the general thoughts of judges in the United States? Are they towards knowing more technology or embrace it? Or is it only for the young students or the students and the law education has to do with it? We have to teach the students into the te technology and big data and data analysis and stuff. Well, let's divide that, if I may, into two parts. Um, one is in terms of um, the judicial branch's receptivity to technology in terms of making um, their um, judgments faster, uh, maybe more efficiently, uh, maybe even based more on data. Um, generally, particularly in the United States, um, the courts have been very slow to adopt technology. Um, and I think that with COVID-19, uh, sadly, um, that has ground our judicial system almost to a halt. And that's the case I know in many other countries as well. Um, that shouldn't be, uh, because in my opinion, uh, courts should be a process, not necessarily a place. Um, and I think that technology has enormous potential um, to uh, create new ways of, and more efficient ways of resolving uh, conflicts of every kind of description. Um, whether it would be alternative methods, you know, arbitration, mediation, um, or maybe it would even be just, you know, the parties. Um, being aided by the courts with certain uh, information that would better enable them without even seeking formal judicial intervention to resolve those things. So in that sense, um, I think the courts have not, uh, as certainly in the States, embraced technology uh, as a way of improving and, and scaling uh, what they do uh, the way they could. I'm hoping that post-COVID, um, that will change. Now, in terms of using technology for demonstrating, you know, proving cases, that's a slightly different story. And judges are becoming much more data-driven 
in terms of you know evaluating cases. Um, so I think there's a little bit of a dichotomy in terms of you know how I would go about answering the question of the judicial response to it. Great, great, Mark, you are a executive chairperson in Digital Legal Exchange. Tell us a little bit of this great, uh, digamos, platform, and what is what are their aims. And what can we expect from your work there? I mean, the, the work of exchange. Well, I'm very glad you mentioned that because this is something that I am really, really excited about. Um, so the digital legal exchange is um, two things, really. Um, it is um, a learning and training center where presently um, general counsel and senior uh, legal leadership of in-house uh, legal departments uh, align with uh, their business counterparts, either uh, the C-suite or senior, senior, senior business leadership uh, within the organization. Um, and um, through various workshops that we um, deliver. Uh, the goal is to um, enable the legal function not only to um, engage in its historical role as enterprise defender, but we want them to be uh, able to be proactive enterprise defenders using data, using technology to obviate many problems before they occur. Um, as well as we want the legal function as increasingly the data is indicating the C-suite wants lawyers to do, to also collaborate with business to drive value, not just saving money on the legal budget, but much more importantly, driving value, measurable value to the enterprise. So you would ask, well, can you give me an example? Yes. Um, so uh, a pioneer in um, this kind of digital approach to the legal function is a fellow called Bill Deckelman of DXC Technology. He's the general counsel. Um, and Bill is on our faculty at the Digital Legal Exchange and DXC um, uh, is one of the um, financial backers of our not-for-profit along with another um, uh, large technology and uh, legal service provider called United Lex. Um, and Bill Deckelman um, uh, realized that um, the contracts uh, of his company, DXC, you know, they have these very, very large, multi, multi-million dollar uh, uh, technology contracts. And he looked and he found that the average negotiation period between, you know, the start and the actual ratification and implementation of a contract was about 13 months. And he said, well, we've got to be able to find a way through our legal department to compress that because 13 months is a very long time. Uh, and that's costing our company a huge amount of money. Um, not to mention, you know, discouraging many potential um, uh, customers from even engaging in the process. So through a series of maneuvers, uh, Bill was able to um, work out a way to compress that sales cycle from 13 months to five months with a very significant impact on the company's bottom line. Um, that is an example of how the legal function can collaborate with business um, to drive value to the core business. And this the digital legal exchange, to come back to what our mission is, is to provide um, the legal function working with its business counterparts um, to um, really um, extract more value, greater value from the legal function. Because law, as you know, Roberto, is not just about uh, providing legal solutions. 
It is about solving business challenges of which the legal risk factor is only one of many different parts. So today's lawyers, and this is something that is really central to the digital legal exchange, today's lawyers really have to get beyond the narrow mindset of solving legal problems. They have to collaborate with people from other disciplines. They have to rely on data to be able to make more holistic, meaningful counsel to customers that is going to drive value to the enterprise. So many lawyers think it's just really all about reducing cost. Of course, cost is one element of it, but the cost is really a byproduct of inefficiency. Uh, and so we are all about um, using the digital tools that are available to help change the mindset and help change the very paradigm of what it means to be a lawyer in the digital age. Totally agree. Totally agree. And let me tell you, it, it's a tough work, you know, facing people with some thoughts very, 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 very structured and really hard. Tell me a little bit about those uh, workshops. Are they online? Can you, do they have it regularly? They have it only in English? Probably do you have, you're thinking about doing some in Spanish for Latin yes. America? Yes. Well, um, so the workshops, I, I just want to add before answering your question directly that we are both a learning and training center, but we are also a community. Right. We, the, the Digital Legal Exchange, we are blessed with a phenomenal uh, faculty from all around the world. We have, just to give you one example, Eric Brenhofsen, who's now leading the, the Digital Innovation Center at Stanford University, he was formerly at MIT. Um, some say that he is the father of digital transformation, at least from an academic perspective. Um, we have academics, not just in law, but also in business. Um, you know, uh, uh, Mari Sacco from Oxford Said School of Business um, is very involved with her project. We have people from government. We are collaborating with the Singapore Academy of Law, where I also hold a position. Um, um, we are not just a group of lawyers, but we are a group of um, lawyers, business people, technologists, computer scientists, and not just from the United States, but from all around the world. Um, so this is the kind of perspective that we bring to our workshops. Now, what typically happens in the workshop is we work with one um, member company at a time. So, for example, we, we uh, before COVID, um, did a, um, a live workshop with uh, Pearson, the publishing, uh, 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 a global publishing company out of the UK. Um, and we worked with their GC and with various members uh, of their senior um, uh, uh, business leaders. Uh, but we were planning even before COVID to uh, uh, go uh, digital with our workshops because I think it's very efficient. People don't have to travel. You can compress the time commitment. And so we are now, you know, doing exclusively digital workshops. Um, they are typically, um, we start with, um, it's now compressed and we now, if you were to add it up, probably do um, less than a full day. Um, sometimes we break it up into two hour segments over three days, but that's of no moment. The point is um, that these are very focused. We do, you know, work very closely with the company before we do our due diligence. We understand what their points of focus are, what their pain points are. And we, it's all about problem solving, Roberto. This is not some, you know, sort of drawing room session where people are smoking cheroots. Um, you know, giving, you know, sort of philosophical uh, 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 expositions on what, what it is that's on their mind. This is about problem solving, real life, real time problem solving. And we follow up with our companies as well. If we give them certain action items, we follow up with them, you know, during the following months to see whether or not they're actually implementing them. Um, we 
create business studies um, about you know what it is that we've done together. And very often, uh, some of the companies decide that they want to continue on a larger, broader digital journey with us. So this is uh, what we do. Great, great. You're mentioning, and it's important to remark that when you mention digital transformation, it's not only technological, it's a mindset. Like Precisely. you definitely mentioned it. I mean, of course the technology is really important, but it's not the plus. The plus is changing the mindset. You are exactly right. And, and that mindset, I think to go even one step beyond, I think it's the purpose of digital transformation is ultimately for the customer, right? It is for creating new ways and new models, new opportunities for customers, you know, to have greater access, um, greater choice. Um, you are using the tools that are now available to us, of which, of course, technology is one critically important tool. But one of the objections that I have to so many of these legal tech conferences is that people say that, you know, technology, a, a particular application is going to, quote unquote, disrupt um, the legal industry or transform the legal industry. It won't. Will it help to enable models and different ways of thinking to disrupt it? Perhaps. Um, so you've really nailed it when you say that this is really ultimately, this is ultimately about people. This is about people, you know, sort of doing things in a different way, using tools that are available to make that happen. But it's ultimately about people. Indeed, it's like this, because technology always is going to be there. Either Correct. the press during the 16th century, but always the, the, the technology will be there. And we have to approach it with a mindset appropriate to that. You, you are absolutely right. I see technology as an enabler. I don't see it as the solution of and by itself. It is. See, I'm, I'm really happy for this conversation, but it's, I'm a little bit you know, sad because a lot of things that we have to talk about and we don't have the time for that. But I don't well, perhaps you'll invite me back one day. Yes, well, I will have some other talks probably. And tell us a little bit, where can we find your jobs and your, your, your writings in Forbes, in uh, Legal Mosaic? And yes. where else um, can we read your, your essays? Well, um, I think probably you can certainly, um, if you Google Mark A. Cohen Forbes, um, they have a list of um, all the publications that I have there, which now I think over the last five years probably number well over a hundred. Um, I've also written um, for different journals around the world. Um, so I think probably the most comprehensive uh, uh, view of um, my, my work, and uh, by the way, some of my talks and things, Uh, would be on my Legal Mosaic website, which is www.legalmosaic.com. Um, if you go to the blog section, you will see there's a search engine. So if you had a particular topic that was of interest to you, you could plug that in. And then finally, I would say, if you have an interest in um, the future of the industry, and more specifically, digital transformation, Uh, I would go to our Digital Legal Exchange website, which is www.dlex, spelled D-L-E-X, dot org. That's org, not com. We're a not-for-profit. I'm going to put those links here down the video. And then just one more while you're at it. Um, uh, you could follow me. You could uh, uh, send me an invite on LinkedIn uh, 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 to join my network, or you could follow me on Twitter at, at Legal Mosaic. I will, I will. Último, Mark. Tú has tenido oportunidad de dar clases y conferencias en Latinoamérica y en España, y debes tener muchísimos alumnos y personas que te han visto. Me gustaría 
unas palabras a esos alumnos que has tenido y a aquellos que han visto tus presentaciones? Un abogado es una especial ocupación y muy importante uh, estudiar um, uh, como un jurista, pero es uh, importante también estudiar uh, otra vez como tecnología, uh, como um, economía como, es muy importante. Sí. Economía. Economía también. Great. Mark, let me tell you, I'm really happy we could do this talk and we'll keep in touch. It was my pleasure, Roberto. You are, it is a wonderful conversation and um, I look forward to the next one. And thank you all for listening. Thank you for having this conversation. Bye.